Good space time, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the Citizen Web3 podcast, your source for educational insights into the Web3 universe and your connection hub to discovering those that contribute to building the decentralized world. Today, we are joined by Brian from Chorus One. We discuss scalable decentralized applications, testing, and surveillance. We dive into preserving of privacy, assuming guilt when using private protocols, and the decline of large nation states. Finally, we touch on keeping it simple, staying focused, and having more control over your life. If you enjoy our podcast, please share this episode on your favorite social platform and help us spread Web3 values into the universe. I enjoy the aspect of, you know, like growing an organization um, and, and building an organization. In general, do I think there's been progress on the private side? No, I would actually say it's gotten worse. And breaches are basically, uh, well, they're not helping, certainly. Blockchains and uh, decentralized networks allow people to have more control over their own assets, their own life, their own decision making. I think if all of the nation states are sort of aligned in, hey, we have to control this thing, and it's a threat. Hi, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of the Citizen Web 3 podcast. Today, I have a guest who was last with me on the Citizen Cosmos podcast. Yeah, so we have a transformation. Brian from Chorus One. Brian, man, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Glad, glad, glad to have you on. I have some questions to follow up to ask you. There's been some progress, but before we get into that, um, you know, uh, usually I start obviously with, with, with asking people to tell their story and considering, of course, um, you've had the chance to, to to say your background story, you know, of how, how you got into, into Web3 and uh, what was the journey, which um, to me is, as far as I remember, I mean, I did have to look at the show notes, I'm not going to lie, it was two or three years ago, but uh, as far as I remember, it had a lot of connections with me. So la- last time... You know, you were on the show, um, you know, we talked about different things and usually I start with uh, asking guests by introducing themselves. And of course, since you already had the, the intro, and which was a while ago, uh, but still, um, I not the question so much about progress, but a question to you as what in your opinion, in the opinion of Brian Crine has changed not in Chorus 1, but in the industry, in the blockchain industry, in Web3. Has there been any changes in the past three years? Has your personal feeling that we, as an, as an industry, progressed somewhere? And if somewhere, where? <laughs> mm. We're going to start heavy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I do think there has been progress. I think there is... Um, you know, a bunch of, well, if you think back in time, right, and I think there was a whole bunch of things where you said, like, okay, these are big bottlenecks, and we have to resolve those things in order to be able to build applications that, you know, really, like, millions of people are going to use. And, you know, one of them, for example, was, like, scalability, right? So, I mean, and I think we had that, you know, years ago, right, like, more people start using it, transactions go to, you know, $50, a transaction, and you, it basically becomes unusable. So I think if you look at scalability as one example, I think we've made, like, huge progress. And now, really, there's, like, a whole bunch of sort of different options, right? You have, like, Cosmos chains, you have Solana, you have um, Ethereum roll-ups, then you have a whole bunch of new layer ones, you know, like Zui, Aptos, Monad, you know, like, n- new things that are coming through. So I think that feels like one area where we've made like really massive progress. Um, you know, I guess uh, interoperability, I think is another thing where we've made a lot of progress. Now, maybe it hasn't been like quite as full on victory as with scalability. Or scalability, I would say we've made this progress, but we still haven't really seen the kind of, you know, the battle test, right? Of like actually something that, you know, a lot of people are going to try to use at the same time. So I, I assume still a lot of things are going to break. But then, you know, I, I'm super confident that, like, we can, we can sort this out. And, and we're pretty close. I think interoperability, yeah. Before you go on, before you go on, before I go into interoperability, give me one example of, of, of scalability that you're talking about. For example, something, boom, stands out. Yeah. I, I mean, 
we've solved, right? So, I mean, I think we have the, you know, here in rollups, for example, they're like doing a lot, like a lot of transactions now. Okay, maybe a bunch of stuff there is a bit questionable in terms of security assumptions and things like that and decentralization. But still, like there's like a you know high degree of throughput. Or you know Solana, I think is doing is doing fine. Again, maybe some issues there, but like with a lot of users. And uh, I think we also seeing the Cosmos chains. You know, like chains like DYDX. You know, have like a good amount of like activity volume. Can really support. Um, a lot of activities and then you know we see new like gaming chains so you know you have these things of just like people using it for the step coins and it's like actually like millions of people who are like using it for some of these things so i i think i think we are going to be in a world where there's going to be like plenty of good options for you to build like a scalable decentralized application and you were going to mention interoperability as well, but I cut off with examples. Uh, what about interoperability then? Yeah, interoperability, right? We basically had like, I think it's also a kind of a success story, you know, where we've had, um, you know, this kind of situation of like isolated different blockchains. And um, now, you know, we have, for example, IBC, right, which has been working super well. And uh, it's supporting, you know, again, like lots of transactions, lots of transfer, lots of value. And then we have a whole bunch of other, you know, interoperability protocols, you know, things like Wormhole, Axelar, uh, you know, they're kind of connecting across the chains. I think there's still issues there, right? I mean, we've seen, of course, rich hacks and uh, user experience is sometimes not great. Um, but still, like, I think we're basically, and, and then you have, you know, aside from just token transfer, right, we're seeing actually a very cool cross-chain applications. You know, I think a great example in Cosmos is Stride, you know, where you basically have Stride as a blockchain that then controls an account on another blockchain and that uh, can stake through that account from the Stride chain, you know, Stride now being secured by the Cosmos Hub and then issue a liquid staking asset. And that's just very cool, right? And it's working. And uh, so I think we are also seeing like more complex uh, cross-chain applications. And I'm sure we're gonna see like lots more of that. So I think these are two big areas where I feel like a lot of progress has been made. And you know, where I'm like uh, very optimistic. I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. wait, 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 wait. Before, before we go on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch on something that we spoke about also last time because one of the last topics was one of the biggest one was safety, and that I remember very well. Privacy versus safety, and me and you spoke about, um, you know, to what extent? Sorry, freedom versus safety, not privacy, but rather freedom versus safety. To what extent, you know, a person is safe while they do it something to what extent you know some what is the difference between privacy and, and safety and freedom and so on and so forth some of the things you mentioned i have to say they they you know yeah let me play my my, my favorite devil's advocate hat on you know they are by many considered um, either economically unsafe or technologically not perfect which is of course that's normal you know technologically nothing is perfect what can be perfect right um what is the extent that those i mean what is the price the question is different is there a price and if what is the extent of that price in terms of privacy and safety that end users today pay uh, or maybe they don't have to pay it uh, for the scalability and the interoperability solutions that are be have been introduced over the past years are they safe and are they private or are they still not safe and not private and the user has to choose between the two. Yeah, right, right. So I mean, on the safety side, um, well, obviously interoperability on the interoperability side, well, I think scalability, I don't think there's, I'm not sure there's really like a trade off there much. I mean, of course, when, maybe when you see something like roll ups, you know, you can say, okay, that's not very decentralized, like you have, uh, but still like, you know, there's actually been no hacks like that. And, and I, so I, I think in general, I don't really see that like, you know, more scalable blockchains become less secure or something like that. I think when it comes to interoperability, well, I mean, we have obviously seen a lot of massive hacks of bridges and, you know, it's probably like among the top in terms of 
category of applications and money lost. I mean, I'm mean, I mean, not sure what the stats are, but bridges will be like near or at the top, right? So clearly there, there's a risk. Um, I mean, IDC, for example, uh, fortunately has not been hacked and no money's been lost, but doesn't mean that couldn't happen in the future. Uh, but still, I think that's a very solvable issue, right? Like, I mean, I think there's uh, a lot of progress there that's being made. Um, I, I, hacks also, it's, it's actually been a while, I think, now that there's been the last big bridge hack. So I think maybe there's already been progress made. Uh, but, you know, there's other solutions. For example, you could say, hey, you're going to use different bridge solutions and they have to agree. And only if they agree, then the transfer gets effective. So I know there's like some... Uh, some teams that are trying to do something like that, that you almost do sort of like a, a multi-sig of different bridges. And so I, I'm pretty confident that that's a you know, very solvable issue. Maybe there will always be some remaining risk, but I, I think that's fine. Now, when the other question around privacy, uh, I think on the privacy side, things look like way less good. Than uh, on these others, I in general do I think there's been progress on the private side? No, I would actually say it's gone worse. And um, and breaches are basically, uh, well, they're not helping. Certainly, uh, I mean I, I don't think any of the known uh, interoperability bridge designs really have like privacy in mind or have like privacy features. Um, so yeah, they they certainly don't reduce the privacy issues. Um, maybe them in some ways. I mean, probably the best privacy solution, right? If we want to go cross chain, uh, which is of course ridiculous, is to use like a, a centralized exchange, right? If you're gonna, you know, put your ETH on Binance and then trade it for Atom and then like withdraw it to your Cosmos Hub account, well, then actually you cannot really link your ETH. I mean, Binance can link your ETH wallet and your Cosmos wallet, but like only they can and not. Uh, so from that perspective, I think pri on the privacy side, the, doesn't look, I would say the situation doesn't look super great. And uh, bridges certainly are not helping. To, to carry on that question while we're still on the token, Topic, not token. Wow, that was a nice uh, Freudian sleep topic. Token. <laughs> do you think? Do you think that, um, like in general, the surveillance that the blockchains today uh, around there uh, has increased rather than decreased? Oh, for sure. No, no, definitely increased. Uh, no question. I think I'm sure it's gotten like a much better, uh, more invasive. Um, what do we do? You know, it's. I think it's a really, really hard one. Um, I'm not totally sure, right? Like, obviously, there are some people working on more privacy-preserving solutions. I think the issue is, first of all, the amount of money that's going into that is pretty limited. Uh, so let's say if you compare, like, scalability or interoperability, right, the amount of money that's been raised around this, I mean, it's enormous, right? Like, scalability especially. But interoperability too, right? It's been, like, I'm sure there's like a billion or more that's been invested in interoperability protocols and many billions in scalability. Privacy? I don't know. Like maybe a few hundred million or something. Uh, so it's a lot more limited. Um, and of course, there's a lot of risks, right? I mean, we, for I think there's risk for investors, there's risk for the developers. I mean, we saw, right? I mean, they arrested um, Tornado Cash, right? Founders and... Uh, I saw, I think they were arrested the other week, you know, some guy oh, was Wasabi from this Bitcoin wallet, right? This kind of samurai, this privacy preserve. Samurai, Bitcoin samurai, wallet. not Wasabi. Samurai, samurai. yeah, yeah. Samurai. There was one samurai. Mm -hmm. So there was more. There was more. It, yeah. So it's, so it's obviously like as an entrepreneur, right? Like you have to be like, or as a developer, you have to be like really, you know, it's risky, right? To, to do something that's like privacy preserving. And then, of course, the other thing is that it's very easy for the regulators to say, "Hey, you centralized exchanges, you know, don't touch, don't touch any of the stuff." So then you can't trade those coins on centralized exchanges, or we get them delisted. And because of the whole on-chain tracing, you can be like, "Hey, look, if you've touched, you know, if you've touched Tornado Cash with your ETH, then you know now you can't deposit that anymore," because uh, you sort of just assume that 
if you engage in a privacy preserving protocols, assume guilt, right? I think that's kind of like this strategy that uh, regulators and governments are pursuing. And I think it's actually really, really hard. I don't know how to, um, you know, I'm not sure exactly how that can be countered. I mean, fortunately, I think there is techno the, the sort of fundamental technology that could enable more privacy, I think, keeps progressing. You know, you have like ZK that's like getting uh, a lot of investment in, mostly for other reasons, not for privacy, but still. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I guess I think the best hope I have would be that crypto enables a lot of people to become comfortable with custody in your own assets and with managing private keys and with using wallets and that we also build a lot of the technology and the infrastructure that would enable more privacy preserving networks and that at some point right at some point the pressure will get so high or like i don't know at some point people will create that kind of privacy preserving thing and it really like breaks through but i don't know i mean i'm not honestly not sure on this one i'm gonna be honest i'm gonna be honest i i i I have the feeling that the problem here is not um, the lack of investment into privacy technology or 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 the investment into the privacy technology from what i have seen as as um i don't know as a validator as a member who of, of of this market for the last 10 12 years or whatever is when this is the feeling i have and this is i'm going to make a question from it you know that i have seen the approach that um, 80 to well to 90 percent of founders and um, other people surrounding projects make regarding privacy is hey i don't want to be guilty of um, having somebody done something bad so it's not that we don't want to invest in, in ZK or whatever, that even if we're going to have anything like ZK, we will make sure that we will find a way to ZK KYC or whatever or something else. And it seems that the whole kind of, well, peop- it seems that people have lost balls. That's why I'm going to be honest with you. Let's say I'm going to be honest. So this is the question that I have. Like, do you think that really like if somebody comes now with 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 you know a trillion or okay trillion maybe is a lot but let's say i don't know five ten billion new euros invested into privacy projects will suddenly and they will develop let's say a, a beautiful privacy technology do you think that other projects will suddenly start implementing it and being like hey let's become private now and fuck the regulators like i i don't see that happening yeah no no i mean i mean i i, mean, I agree with you uh, I think it's a kind of like equilibrium where, you know, nobody is going to invest this 5 billion into privacy crypto because, yeah, why would projects risk, you know, going to jail or founders to like implement this stuff? And, um, and, and then even if they did, then, you know, like other crypto things are just like wall it off or block it or not allow trading of those assets and so yeah i think it's a difficult one i mean maybe what's needed is you know this kind of like network state direction where you know maybe there will be some countries that are really saying like hey look we actually embrace i mean historically right there's a lot of things have um like historically, I think governments have often been pretty preserving of privacy, right? I mean, I think there's, isn't there, I think there's some law in many places around like mail, right? That uh, if you send a letter, they, you know, someone can't just open the letter, right? Like even the government, I think, I, I mean, maybe, but at least in some places, I think it is like that. Or, um, you know, they can't just break into your home, right? And like, but they have to have a warrant and things like that. Uh, or that you cash, of course, right? I mean, cash is super privacy preserving. And so there's a lot of things, uh, or, you know, in Switzerland, you have this like bank secrecy thing, right? Where like, okay, the government can't even ask the banks, like how much money do you have, right? Like, um, so historically it has been there, but then I think that has just completely eroded and and governments don't really 
um, you know, value that anymore, stand up for that anymore. But I think there may be an opportunity there, right? Maybe an opportunity if if that kind of like uh, if you see more of a decline of large nation states and more problems, maybe some of them default, and it kind of gives the opportunity maybe for different types of um, governments and states to arise again. Then I could imagine some of those saying like, "Hey, look, let's really." actually embrace privacy and the right for people to privacy even in this new digital context and you know maybe then people who value it could say i'm going to move there and um because i think if all of the nation states are sort of aligned in hey we have to control this thing and it's a threat and we need to know whatever we can so we can keep this under control that's i think really hard stance to be in and i mean that's where we are today I think just about half a year after your episode, or maybe a bit more, uh, the last one, I mean, I, I had a conversation uh, of, of privacy with, with who else but Chris Goes, right? And he had a very beautiful opinion about semantics and syntax and how we view today the word privacy means so many things, whether, you know, speaking into somebody's window and financial information are both in the semantical term, in the large semantical term, mean the same thing, and they should not. And it's interesting how he went into oh, propose, not not proposing, not offering a solution, right? But into this like of a talk of maybe this is the first step that our semantics and syntax here need to be kind of in order when it comes to 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 privacy and when it comes to what we understand by privacy, what we understand by secrecy. What is the difference between different types of private information? And, you know, one thing, again, somebody picking into your home from a window and one thing is public company uh, sending some information about another public company uh, or public uh, contract they did, for example. Right. So, yeah. But, yeah, it's a big topic. Let's hope that uh, one, one day we will survive. Yeah. I mean, I feel like Enoma and that team is like one of the one of the few right that's like you know really strong technical team that really has valued uh and worked on more privacy preserving technology so i'm very excited about you know them launching and and the kind of things they've been building i mean i i promised you at the beginning that this is i'm gonna try and focus it more about chorus one and i want to but before that i have one question for you which derived from a sentence you just said a couple of minutes ago um you were about to say developer or entrepreneur, but you haven't placed yourself in either. So before I start asking, who do you today identify as a developer or an entrepreneur? Because I think it's important. Yeah, well, I'm not a developer. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, okay. my, you know, technical competency is like far, far, far too low. So yeah, I do. I would say I do identify as like an entrepreneur. I like, uh, I like that. And uh, I think it's something that I enjoy and, and I imagine something I, you know, I will kind of continue doing for a long time, even if at some point I work on something different from crypto. Okay. Okay. Interesting. But now, now, now that that is, is, is settled because it, it is, I, I do want to ask about the, you know, I can, I'll tell you the thing. Um, considering we ourselves, you know, became a bare metal validator and we started to build some validator tools and so forth. And then um, we decided to refocus a little bit of just for talking only to founders to talk to people who commit to this economic, the web tree economic as, as every day, every second, every block. And, and those are validators, of course. And um, what has been the validator journey over the past um, because I know you, you as a person, you do a lot of things. I know you do, you're involved with foundations. Obviously, you're. Um, I don't know if it's okay if you identify like that or not. But you know, an angel investor, I guess, as well, right? And uh, you really so just mentioned you're an entrepreneur. And also, there is Chorus One. And I'm curious, what, in your opinion, role does Chorus One today play in 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 your life and in the life of of, of uh, cosmos and ethereum and everybody else because you guys are involved in a lot of things so let's talk a little bit about chorus one what has been the the 101 so to speak over the past three four years with with chorus one and what are you guys working on what are you focusing on what is your ambitions 
Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, I think you said it before, right? Uh, the sort of thing of like, you know, every second, uh, you know, new blocks being created and transactions being processed. And, and I think that's one of the things I really like about uh, the staking business about course one, right? Is so we, we run infrastructure for, I think something like 60 networks today. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you just, if you take like, you know, how many, like, let's say on average, I don't know what the average is, but let's say the average is like six seconds or something block time, right? Then it's something like, okay, we're maybe we're more from like 10 blocks a second or something either proposing or verifying. And so I think that's, that's, you know, the really core of like running validators is, is basically you keep. Uh, those blockchains running, you process all the transactions, you create the blocks. So it's really at the very, very core of uh, decentralized networks and blockchains. And I think that's super cool. I really, I'm really like that. I like sort of working on like the fundamental things that like don't change. And um, yeah, so I mean, of course, one, right? So that, I mean, that's really the main thing, right? So the main thing for us is uh, running validators and staking infrastructure. Now, staking infrastructure has also a lot of different flavors, right? Because a lot of different customers, a lot of different needs, a lot of different staking designs. Uh, and, and so, you know, we are, I think we're almost 70 people now uh, working on this for, um, yeah, for like, we're working for a lot of, individuals who are staking with us we work with a lot of vc funds uh we work with custodians we work with exchanges we work with wallets you know uh we run validators on behalf of other people who have like their own brand their own community um yeah so that's 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 by far the number one thing at chorus one and then you know the other thing that we also do is we we've been investing uh, and we've been doing that for quite a while as well. I think we started doing it at the end of 2020. Uh, so it's been, yeah, almost four years that, we, that we've been investing. I think you, for our very first investment was uh, Lido. Uh, and, but yeah, so we've, we've done around 70 different investments uh, to date. A lot of Cosmos investments too. Like we've invested in, I think, around 30 different Cosmos projects. Um, uh, and so, yeah, that's also a key thing for us is, you know, to look at like new things that are coming up, new protocols, new types of companies and services that are all trying to move this forward. And then, you know, you invest in the things that one we like and we identify with, but also things that where there's like synergies. Either we're going to run infrastructure for it or there's some other type of, you know, partnership or integration. Uh, so, yeah, that's basically course one. And um, it's definitely still the number one uh, priority for me. And I expect it it will stay that way for for quite a while. You know, when I speak I hope it will. to guests, I always make notes of, of when they talk, what to ask them. And and the note I just made is 1.1 people per chain. <laughs> when you said 60 chains, but 70 people, I was like, okay, oh, it's not 1.1. Okay, my math is a bit bad, but, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. it was funny. I was like, okay. So this is crazy if you think about it. It means that you need more than one person to work per chain that's crazy it's actually for people to understand who are out there you know of like they always ask what do validators do where is where is the time going you know so here you go you have 60 chains and 70 people on the project that's yeah now of course the say so this is like everyone right so around of course uh, en engineers is around half of them and then on the engineering side too, there's, you know, people doing other things, you know, working more on like product front end type of stuff. So, you know, like pure infrastructure, people running infrastructures, maybe like 25 or something like that, 2025. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, it is a good, it is a good point, right? That I think there's definitely this sort of relationship of, you know, you onboard more chains, it gives you more work and then you need more people. And, you know, we have been in this situation where, uh, where basically the demand for, uh, you know, people coming to us and say, hey, can you run this infrastructure? Can you, can you support this chain is, you know, higher than what we can support. 
And, uh, and that has a lot to do with that ratio, right? Because then, of course, we can maybe grow the team at a certain rate, but that's kind of slow. And, of course, we don't want to, you know, just hire. I mean, we've always been fairly slow in terms of growth and hiring. But it is, it's definitely, I would say, one of the things. Brian, your mic. Mike, <laughs> we've yeah, been slow so, in terms of growth and hiring. Uh-huh. Yeah, we've been slow in terms of growth and hiring, uh, but it's definitely one of those things that we want to do uh, to be able to say, hey, we've, you know, we, we can start growing the number of networks that we support, you know, disproportionately. You know, if we, if you say like, okay, maybe we double the engineering team size, but we are able to do four times as many networks. Uh, but you know, that's, that's a hard, hard problem. And it's going to take us uh, can you a though? while to get there. Do you think, I think you we can? can? Yeah. Yeah. I think we can. We do invest quite a lot in like, uh, AI also around this. And so I think that can be uh, very helpful for this, but you know, again, it's going to take us, it's going to take quite a long time, I think, to really, um, realize that. I think today Cosmos Station is probably, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, the, 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 the validator with the biggest amount of support for networks or due to obvious reasons, of course. But um, I'm very curious. The last time I spoke to David was, was so long ago. I would be curious to understand how, you know, I mean, well, you have 60 networks and that's already, uh, sorry, 70, you know, it's already, sorry, 60. Like mind blowing when you say let's double that, you know, to 120, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, okay. Okay, serious. But serious. totally, totally, that's very true, right? There are there are definitely teams that actually are much smaller than we are, and that are supporting like as many or more networks than we do. So, uh, I'm in hats off to them. That's really amazing, and I I don't totally understand how they managed to do that. I'm I'm gonna be honest with you. Like over the past year, of speaking primary to validators i've had guests who are one man team and i've had guests like yourself of course who are representatives of your founders or a very huge um, um team and sometimes i'm i'm shocked as to how you know like one or two guys because we are also a validator you know and i'm also sometimes like what on earth when it comes a guy who says oh we're running i'm running like seven or ten networks out of my basement and like Dude, like, you know, I'm going to add 10 more now. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> God, man, those guys are crazy. They have the motivation and the efficiency that I think I, I definitely don't don't possess. But, um, man, let, let me ask you this. You said um, in the middle of your, when you were talking, you said that, you know, you have came to the point where you started to refuse um, networks that start coming to you uh, being a validator due to the lack of simply... Um, infrastructure possibilities and, and resources in terms of manpower. What are other reasons that you have been saying have to had already not would say no, that but already said no to networks apart from infrastructure? Uh, no. Yeah, I mean, of course, we we've been uh, we've been running this process for years, right? We're basically okay. We have some pipeline. There's like potential network. We do some research on it. And then we decide, oh, maybe we're going to onboard this or not. And so this is not a new thing, right? Like we've been doing that since forever, basically. And, you know, there's a simple reason, right? It's just like, oh, we have like limited bandwidth and we have to choose where to allocate it. But in terms of like how we make those assessments, there's a whole, a whole bunch of different uh, factors. Um, you know, I mean, I can go through some of them, of course, let's say, there is a factor of economics, right? Like how big is the market cap? What is inflation? You know, the tokenomics, because, you know, we want to be sure that if we, we have a chance to earn like, you know, decent revenues from it, then maybe there's the thing of like, you know, integration, cost, complexity. Uh, so let's say if it's like a Cosmos network and, you know, we run lots of Cosmos networks, of course, it's like much simpler than if it's, completely different L1, own staking design, you know, who knows, maybe they have some other kind of complexities. So that's another one. Uh, you know, then I think it's sort of, you know, like the quality of the project, you know, is like, is the code well written? Is it, does the vision make sense? Um, things like that, you know, is the traction or the people using it, building on it? Um, you know, also matters if like, 
how much stake do we get? Like, you know, maybe we have like existing investors or, or customers of ours that are like, hey, we have this token, we want to stake this token, or maybe we don't. So like, you know, that that's factors too. Um, so there, yeah, a lot, lot of different factors. Uh, uh, let me let me uh, let let me let me take it a little bit of, of a different way because I understand that, that that this this didn't connect the question. But let me let me take it a bit of a different way. Um, I want to know, you know, you talk about a lot about investment, and you talk about you mentioned, you know, investing into different projects and running infrastructure for different projects. I'm still curious today, though, apart from being a business, a for-profit business that, of course, you know, earns you personally because we're talking about brian right now um some revenue which is perfect right but i don't believe that that's your only like thing that drives you inside i'm curious today after five years or four years of running uh this journey this validator you know that has been like you see you said yourself starting with infrastructure then going into investment going to other things what is today remains your vision and for 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 chorus one uh that drives you personally as brian to to keep on doing it yeah yeah i mean i would say there's uh there's maybe like so one thing is the thing i you know is the thing i think we talked about it last time you know i think it's just the idea that like okay uh blockchains and uh, decentralized networks allow people to have more control over their own assets, their own lives, their own decision making, and allows people also to build things, uh, you know, to, to entrepreneurs to like realize their vision and their idea without having to ask for permission, without, you know, just going ahead and doing it and, you know, building on top of other people. So I do feel that like eventually this can lead to a world that's more open, more fair, uh, more innovative, like more wealthy, uh, more resilient. Uh, so I think so. So I think that is that's definitely a big part of it. Um, I would also say I enjoy the aspect of um, you know like growing an organization um, and and building an organization. So. I think it's there's something just super rewarding around getting a whole bunch of like great people together and try to set up a structure and incentives and the culture and methods so that they can work together really well and you know kind of form a team and align and then you know achieve something together you know I think it's just as human beings if you can if you can do that, right, if you can kind of get together with other people, have a shared vision, share goals, and then realize them, I think that's just inherently more satisfying than, you know, doing something on your own. So I, I, I find that aspect, like, you know, uh, really satisfying and exciting. And, you know, I care a lot about that. So, you know, I spend a lot of time, like, interviewing people and because uh, you know, I care a lot about like you know the kind of people we hire and like for me it's like very exciting when we hire like great new great people that I'm like makes me very uh, makes me happy and excited and and I think that's like definitely also one of my biggest areas of focus is is exactly that like getting great people and then trying to trying to set up a sort of organization and culture where they can do their best work and they're happy and and they want to do a great job. Um, so yeah, I feel like these are probably the two main things for me. I think it was Steve Jobs, right, who said that um, uh, an idea becomes a project when it leaves a person's head, and other three, at least three other people, start to participate in that idea. That when it becomes a project, I think. Yeah. His sentence. I Man, don't know. On a, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think it was. I think. I think. But I was trying to connect to, to what you were saying about building. Um, you know, building something rather than having it in your head and doing it solo. But um, on 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 the topic of the validator, I wanted to go back to that. And um, you know, again, sixty networks, huge number. What is the current setup that you guys use? Are you thinking about bare metal, or are you using any bare metal today? Yeah, yeah, I know. We we have uh, we are basically you know almost fully bare metal. Wow, and have been for 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 years. 
I didn't know. Yeah. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about it? Yeah. Like what 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 what's what's your what's what's your bare metal story and uh, how how does it go? Yeah, and, and sure. Sure. I mean, I would say to some extent, uh, it's how, you know, when we started, right, it was like, okay, there's going to be like, uh, you know, we started with Cosmos and then uh, we used a UBHSM, right? So there's basically an HSM, a small, uh, very small and kind of cheap HSM, but still an HSM. HSM means basically like a separate device that, where the private keys in there and that there's a signing there. So you have kind of like higher security than if the uh, key is just on, on a server and someone hacks into the server, they can steal the key. If an HSM, because it's kind of segregated, you have higher security. So from the beginning, we were always like, oh, we should use this, right? And, and we did. So, but you cannot use that in the cloud, really. There's no uh, cloud support for like UVHSM. There is limited cloud support for HSM, other types of HSMs, but you know, not, not this and not. So we had from the beginning, we kind of had like, okay, now we did have also quite a bit of infrastructure in like AWS and, you know, running nodes there and Google Cloud. Uh, but we had, we always had this kind of bare metal, uh, some infrastructure in bare metal. And then, you know, at some point, so in, I think aside from that security aspect, it was also just a bit of a maybe philosophical thing, like wasn't really drawn to the idea of, of running all this in, you know, in a big centralized cloud provider. It seems to kind of a little bit defeat the whole purpose of the thing. But then uh, actually at one point we, uh, so this is also now quite a long time ago, maybe like three years ago, or four years ago. But we were, we said, okay, we wanted to migrate fully off the cloud. Uh, I think at the time, actually, our, I remember our infrastructure cost was like 25K a month or something. We were paying to Amazon. So it was a lot of money too. And, um, and, and yeah, we, when, when we did it also, you know, we just, there was massive cost savings with it too. I think cost went down by like 80% uh, at the time, you know, from that change. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, we've also, I think we also have this kind of engineering culture a bit around it, you know, where, um, you know, we've always tried to hire people who are, you know, the kind of people who care about the low level stuff and who, you know, care about, oh, how does the networking work? And cause of course the big difference, right. For, oh, it's basically when you, when you have bare metal, right. You you control the entire server. So you have to decide all of the software that runs on there. You have to deal with everything yourself. Whereas if you are using something like AWS, then you are the kind of, the hardware is abstracted from you. And there's a bunch of sort of services that run underneath that are meant to make it easier for you and abstract some of the complexity, but it also means you don't deal with a whole bunch of the stuff. So uh, I think a lot of engineers uh, even like DevOps engineers, if they're used to cloud, then they don't really understand the underlying stuff because they don't have access to it if they use AWS. But we had, you know, we also just had uh, always this sort of uh, engineering culture. And then, you know, we had the people who started interviewing and they were all like, we just don't hire anybody like that. So we've always been like hi uh, trying to hire people who have an interest and knowledge of the more kind of low level uh, systems, networking, um, design. So, cause yeah, I think you'll, you need very different team as well. If you want to do everything bare metal versus in the cloud, but you know, for us, it's very deeply ingrained in our culture. So I think it, you know, uh, but it's, I'm happy we went down that route for sure. I'm curious. It's a, if you can talk about it, of course, it's a bare metal that uh, you guys rent still in server spaces, or this is privately owned bare metal that you actually, you know, the difference, right? There is like some validators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no, we still, we still, we don't all like operate data centers and stuff. So it's basically like, you know, we, we will like buy or lease servers in different data centers. And then, you know, we just control those servers and control what happens in those servers. That's interesting. It's, 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 um, there is also like, you know, two camps I've noticed in bare metal who one 
advocates for hey it's only the real bare metal is only if i have the servers in my own server room and then the other guy says well no because i have still access to the servers and uh, uh, do you think that there is a difference between those two camps or or do you think it doesn't really matter as long as it's bare metal yeah good question i'm not sure i mean in the end you can think you can still fully control it and you know you're like ssh into it and of course like well i mean what is the worst thing that someone can do who operates this thing i mean i think the, the worst thing they could probably do is just unplug it or something like that i don't think they can do like much else is my understanding but they could like yeah they could like shut it down but then you know i mean this kind of, i mean at first of all we do use a whole bunch of different providers and we did also have the experience of you know we were for example we had a lot of infrastructure in in this french company called obh and they had a fire in their data center in france and we were in that data center we had a lot of infrastructure in there so we basically had to then uh migrate over you know things from there uh to other places like you know super fast and that actually were ended up working pretty well uh i mean it was still you know like a few, two weeks or something of like you know sleepless nights and stuff for you know a bunch of engineers but you know we had very little downtime almost no downtime and almost no disruption so i think it's fine i i don't really i mean of course it's huge um running your own data center i mean also, also sometimes we need it in certain geographical locations you know because of latency and things like that so uh you know we in the end we have nodes on you know all over the world and in, in many different places in europe and stuff like that so like it's just not practical um you know maybe at some point if you get like massive massive scale you know obviously like amazon builds their own data centers and stuff but uh but I, obviously we are like way 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 uh far from that kind of scale and i think for us like just renting space seems like totally fine you know on 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 um the topic you mentioned about uh, you know using hsms and you know some some validators of course use um horcrux somebody used the kms somebody uses other solutions you know like yourselves and there are there are many different solutions and um, there are different levels of security validators can take by you know storing their keys on a ledger using ledger or don't know whatever there are there are millions of, of levels and interactions you can go into it but um something i want to ask you because when we started our migration to bare metal about like i don't know half a year ago and we're still not finished you know because we are working with privately owned bare metal and that's of course creates a lot of a pain in the ass with uh, current electricity is a very interesting one but um anyways um what we noticed is that you know not many validators comma not many chains give a damn shit i'm sorry for my french here about things like being able to sign things from a ledger or about you know using something like uh, multi signers like horcrux or anything like that and i'm curious is it just my terrible experience by talking with and i'm not talking about the guests here i'm actually talking about my experience with interacting on you know on the internet with 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 our colleagues has it been my experience so negative or i don't know i mean i i've realized that many chains out there that we come to validate and we want to launch a validator and we want to create you know a key it's simply impossible even because they don't support ledger they don't so and it's like hey how the hell have you got a chain that's worth you know 50 to 100 million dollar market cup and you still don't even support ledger in your own chain you know and then we mean for you, ledger for signing. the about for the validator yes yes operation. yes Yes, yes, yes. Well, for example, I guess a lot of people want to use that, right? Like we wouldn't use Ledger, for example, you know, because it's like, it's just not very practical to control it remotely, you know, because then someone has to go in there, put the pin, and like, how do you do that? And so like, uh, and then, you know, I think this, yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> but yeah, these teams, I guess, you know, generally it's just they're, they have very limited resources, right? And they're in a rush and they're trying to move fast. And then they're just like, and, and often they have no experience, right? They, if, what's it actually like to run a chain and run a validator and run the infrastructure for it? They just like, you know, end up creating something. And of course we have it all the time that like, 
you know, we onboard some chain and then there's a whole bunch of issues because, you know, the way they either maybe design the protocol or the way they manage keys or things like that, or it's just not very friendly from an operator perspective. And then we have to, you know, decide what to do, you know, either it's like sometimes maybe we say, Hey, we can't support this chain, or maybe we have to build some kind of solution around it, or we have to develop some own software, or maybe we say like, we have to take some kind of, you know, compromise or different solution maybe than what we would like to. So, um, yeah, I think that's just, uh, that's just the reality. And I think that's something that's, uh, I mean, I think over time, hopefully, especially the projects that do well, will will tend to, you know, invest in this and improve things. But, you know, often also things are just, design decisions from the beginning and they're kind of a hassle and hard to correct. Like to give an example, uh, you know, some of the chains, they, uh, you know, in, in the Cosmos chains, right, we used to, okay, the, the rewards are distributed automatically, right? Like they just go to the users, they can claim the rewards whenever they want to, validator can claim the rewards when you want to. Uh, but, you know, some other chains don't work like that, right? Some other chains will, like, send the rewards to the validator, and then we have to run some script and send the transactions to send it to the delegators. Horrible, right? Like, really annoying experience. Now you have to run the script, and maybe it fails. Some transaction doesn't go through. You have to check, like, which didn't go through. And then, like, it creates a lot of, like, hassle and overhead. But, you know, some chains just did it like that, right? And at some point, for whatever reason, I don't know, maybe it was hard to do it the other way because of the chain, or maybe just think of it, or maybe they thought this wouldn't be an issue or that someone else will have to deal with it. But then, yeah, then you just have to, you have to kind of, um, yeah, deal with these issues. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a job too, right? Understood. Let me ask you one last question before I'm going to jump into a quick blitz with you and then uh, to wrap up. But the question is going to be more uh, down to earth than than rather um, philosophical. Um, considering all that experience and considering, you know, the success of the, of the of the operator as an operator, as a validator, you know, which I think can be really said that it's there, you know, honestly. Uh, well done on that. Um, what would be if you could right now? I know, I know it's impossible, of course, to to just uh, at top of your head or, you know, to summarize something like that because as a founder you don't see yourself as other people do, even if it's negative or positive, especially if it's positive. Actually, it's the hardest thing to see to see the positive, at least for me. I don't know uh, how if it works the same for you. Um, I mean, in myself, right? What would be though for you if you had to try at least now on the top of on the spot here to to suggest you know there is a lot of people there who are still interested and the validator uh, from what I see that the world is growing the numbers are really 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 growing the more people joining and understanding that this is a cool way to monetize a web three business um, you know as somebody who has done all this journey and we spoke about something similar last time but we didn't actually manage to get to that. What would be something you would now tell them? Something one thing to do and one thing not to do. <laughs> so, if you were to say start a staking company, I mean, yes, today. yes, absolutely. Sorry for the misconception. Mis yeah, vagueness. well, I mean, the one thing to do, I think, like pretty clear. Well, uh, the first thing that definitely comes to mind is, you know, you have to think about, you know, the distribution. Right, like you have to think about who is going to stake with you, and why. And uh, because in the end, there's a ton of validator companies, right? Like there's a, there's a lot of options and a lot of good ones too. And so it's going to be really hard, right, to get uh, to get stake, to get a significant amount of stake, to grow that stake into like a viable business. Um, I mean, I think if you if you want to do something that's more kind of, you know, minimal, cheap, at home organization, you do it yourself with some friends, and then maybe you can get some stake from some foundations or some kind of programs that try to, to make it more decentralized, you know, that kind of thing can maybe work, right? But like still, like, I think you need to be very clear about like, you know, who's going to stake with you and why and how much and like, is that is that going to result in a viable business? Uh, because it's 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 definitely difficult and uh, competitive, right? And a lot of alternatives. Uh, one thing not to do. 
Uh, well, I have so many, but I want to hear yours. <laughs> I fucked everything up, so man, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, I'm gonna say two things, maybe, because uh, there are like two things that just come to mind or like mistakes uh, we made. I think one thing is just to keep it simple. You know, I think in the beginning, actually, you know, talking about keys and stuff. In the beginning, in the first year, we spent a lot of time trying to build this system with like automated failover, where we'd have like two valves running live, and if one goes down, the other one automatically takes over. And in the end, it was stupid. Right? In the end, like just having like monitoring, being sure, okay, this one goes down, you spin up the other one. Maybe there's like a minute or two of downtime, or t- five minutes, or ten minutes even, but nobody cares. It's a hundred times simpler, and like so, I think. You don't like don't over engineer some really complicated thing, but just uh, so that so that's one thing we definitely mess up. The other thing is focus. I think you know, like I think when you do some startup uh, or project, then I think it's important to stay focused, not to try to do too many things at the same time. Uh, but like you know, focus on the one thing and do it well and go all the way and improve it as much as you can. Uh, yeah, so I think these would be my two. Uh, I I gotta be advice. honest with you. The over the not over complicating things is probably something everyone should hear before they start doing this. This is yeah. I think it should be one of the at least number one, two, three. I'm I'm sure about it. It's really important. Man, let me do a very quick blitz with you, a bit different from the last time, so it's gonna be shortened. Give me one book or movie or a song that has been with Brian and been positive throughout your life something one or book or movie or a song but positive influence on you throughout your life mm. okay uh i'll go with book and uh so i read this book like maybe 15 years ago maybe a bit less but it's called radical honesty and it's basically a book about the idea that a lot of like stress and you know disconnect and depression and all kinds of things basically come from uh, lying or, or or not expressing things that you're feeling and and you know the idea that like okay you should try to be like you know completely honest at all times and bring up things you feel like maybe you feel upset with someone you should talk about it right maybe if you're grateful for something you should express it so i would say that that book has had a big impact Love it. on me Love it, love it. Give me one technological direction, not blockchain, apart from blockchain. It's for example, machine learning, but you already mentioned machine learning, so I'm gonna make you think. Give me another technological direction that you're curious in personally. Not blockchain, not not AI, because everybody says those two. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I mean, I feel like it's gonna be really boring out so because <laughs> probably like half of Come the on. people here would like say the same. Okay, no, I'm gonna say another one. Uh okay, and then maybe another one then. So I've been interested in so I'm a big fan of this software called Obsidian. And Obsidian is basically some kind of, you know, personal knowledge management tool. Basically, think of like a software where you can take all your notes and you can interlink them and connect them and sort of build up knowledge over time. And I'm a big fan of that. I think that's like super promising and powerful. And uh, so, and so I'm really excited about this kind of software and this kind of software getting like better with time. Personal knowledge graphs. I'm also a geek man, so it's okay. I understand. I understand <laughs> totally. It's a big thing for me as well. So, okay, last one. And I promise we're finished. Last one. It's gonna be a bit more more obscene and obscure. Sorry, and more and more difficult. So. Dead or alive, real or imaginary, made up or developer or whatever, give me one person who is not a guru, because gurus are not something positive in my opinion, but a character or a person or a book character or maybe somebody you know even that has had a positive influence on you, um, not necessarily all your life, but at least the last years or so. Um, hmm. Person, character who had a positive influence. Could be made up. It could be, you know, yeah, Donald yeah, Duck. Yeah. But it could be real. Yeah. <laughs> Donald Trump. Yeah. Good question. 
Okay, I mean, this is like, okay, probably violates your, uh, violates your uh, directive as well. But, uh, you know, I've been in- interested in Buddhism for a long time. And, and you know, one, I wouldn't say, that, I, I wouldn't say there's like a single person that's been like most important there, but may- maybe the last few years I've been kind of practicing with this Tibetan uh, teacher, Nice. Or his name is Minju Rinpoche. And he's really great. Uh, Actually, very cool. I'll write it cool in answer. the chat. Please. Yeah. Please. And I think he had he's had some some impact, some positive impact. Can can we reference him? It's okay, right? Yeah, yeah totally, because we like totally. to yeah, He's very him. known. He's also. he's very he's very uh he's he's quite famous. He's written some very successful books and stuff like that. Yeah. Cool. I cannot pronounce it correctly, so I'm not going to. So I'm sorry, apologies. But we will definitely reference it in the show notes. So guys, check it out. Brian, I'm more than thankful for your time and for the second time answering my annoying questions. I understand. I get it. <laughs> so I, I appreciate and applaud you for uh, keeping up with me for uh, twice now. <laughs> um, and hope- No, not at all. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, you too, man. Hopefully, we'll talk again some, in some time and see what has been the, the progress uh, the next time we talk, man. And hopefully see you in Berlin Blockchain Week. Now, for everybody, please don't hang up just yet. This is just for everybody. Bye, and thank you for joining. And see you next time on Citizen Web 3, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, Brian. This content was created by the Citizen Web 3 Validator. You may support our work by delegating to any of our nodes.